You're listening to the Smaller Supercharged podcast with Rhea Freeman, episode 131. On today's podcast, I'm joined by, she's basically like a, a legend. Uh, let's be honest. I just set you up quite high there, Jackie. Um, we're going to be joined today by Jackie McCormick, who is a solution focused hypnotherapist. Now, I first met Jackie through Vic Bodie off of Equiboodle fame, um, because during lockdown, as you probably know, Vic did an awful lot of live content. I think it was basically every day, but the Sunday slot was Jackie because of her, well, she's going to tell us all about it anyway, but because of the sort of the positive vibes and the reframing and everything that went into the week. So I'm really excited to have her on the podcast today. So hello, Jackie. (laughs) <laughs> Hello. A legend. a legend. A legend, no less. Oh, maybe I've no, been known for being a legend in other ways, but mm, not this. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Um, so I don't really know where to start with you, actually, because it's when you really came to kind of my attention was through Vic, through uh, Boodle Box. And I know you've been friends with Vic forever, but it was really good to sort of see that in the equestrian space. Actually, since then, that's grown as well. So maybe let's go back to the start. Let's talk about actually what is solution-focused hypnotherapy? Because when it was first mentioned to me, I thought, oh yeah, trance stuff, no control of your own actions, not good with that. But that could not be further from the truth. So how did you get into it to start with? Um, Well, so I've always been in the field of um, social care. So I've worked and set up a charity for people with Asperger's syndrome like nearly 30 years ago. Um, so I've done that for a very long time. And I got to the point where I think, well, I, I went, I was going through a divorce um, and thought I kind of needed a bit of help. So I went and saw a wonderful lady, a solution focused hypnotherapist many years ago. And um, I went and I had two sessions and I thought, I want to do this. I can do this. This really interests me. So I asked her where she trained and she was very lovely. She wasn't, oh, you know. Um, <laughs> so I went to um, an amazing place in Bristol um, that was run by a gentleman called David Newton. Um, and, but anyway, so I did my training there. And obviously I still work and I still run the charity for people with Asperger's syndrome. But this really, for me, was something for me mm. um, to do. And also looking to my future. Um, but I've always been fascinated by the brain. I mean, that's kind of what I'm into is how the brain functions and how what we do affects our future and our all kinds of things, particularly, I mean, I was, I didn't do it to work with people with autism because I wanted something different. Um, you know, I wanted to kind of not get away from autism, but just, just something different. So yeah, so I went and trained there, um, in Bristol and then set up my business. And it's kind of grown from that, really. So solution focused therapy is really about helping an individual to look at their preferred future, their preferred way of being. And it's definitely not the hypnotherapy bit is definitely not making you cluck like a chicken and do anything you don't want to do. It's essentially accessing your subconscious. So we all go into trance many times during the day when we're watching telly, when we're reading a book, when we're walking the dog, when we're riding our horse, um, your brain just goes off and it thinks of lots of other things. And that essentially is trance. So it's when the the subconscious and your kind of conscious meet together and, you know, start processing stuff. Um, So that's the hypnotherapy bit of what I do. It's it's probably quite small, to be honest. Um, The most important bit is is helping people to realise that, if we keep going back over old patterns of behavior and old thoughts, actually all we're doing in the brain is, is hard wiring them. So the neuroscience of the brain is, is really important to understand. That's not to say we all need a degree in it or anything like that, but the, my job is to educate people into how we think and what we do kind of affects this amazing thing, our brain. And to really help people to understand that and then to understand how we can change those neuro pathways those patterns of behavior so when people say to me and they do a lot um well that's just the way i am and that's always the way i've been ask anybody um my job is to go okay but would you like to be different um and if you were different what difference would it make to you and others around you Mm. um and of course initially people are a bit 
yeah, but I can't, you know, I can't just change. It's not as easy as that, for goodness sake. And the, um, the good old yes buts come into play. And yeah. we all do it. I oh, do it. hands up. I do too. <laughs> we all do. I mean, I've actually had a couple of sessions with Jackie, so I can say from experience, yeah, I do. And actually nothing that you, I bet everyone that is listening to this is going, yeah, that's me. Yeah, I do it. I mean, goodness me, you know, um, because that's life and we are human and our brains are very powerful. But one of, the, one of the things that I really try and get people to understand is if we function, we function mainly from two areas of our brain. So your, your, your cortex, your prefrontal cortex, which is kind of your boss brain, as we call it, um, where you just get on with stuff and you just, you know, you know what you're doing. You know how to cross the road, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, we have this wonderful area, or not so wonderful at times, um, the limbic system, which is your kind of emotional brain. And a lot of us function from a lot of the percentage of time from our emotional brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's our yes, but brain. Um, however, that's understandable because we all have things go on in life that causes us stress and anxiety. Yeah. Sometimes we might impose a wee bit too much of that on ourselves. Um, but if we get into those kind of negative pathways, then of course that's all the brain knows. It doesn't know anything else because we keep telling it that that's what we do. So when you talk about the different parts of your brain, as you say, we've got the, the, correct me if I'm wrong. I do, I do have quite an interest in this. As Jackie knows, I've got quite an interest in this, but there's a really good book called The Chimp Paradox. And he talks about that you're kind of, he doesn't call it a monkey brain. Chimp paradox. It's a chimp. Your inner chimp. That is the limbic system, isn't it? Which is trying to protect you. That's your amygdala. So your amygdala is your fight, flight or freeze response. And it's your health and safety officers we also call it so you can see it as a person in their white coat with a clipboard and they're ticking off all this is that safe can we allow you to do that and so yes the inner chimp and it's a great book um he's also done one for children um yeah yeah really good and i've got it actually it's called my hidden chimp um oh so that's a that's a different part of the brain altogether as well that's in the limbic system. So your amygdala is in your, is in your limbic system. So within the, <clears throat> excuse me, within the limbic system also, you have your kind of hippocampus, which so <clears throat> is your memory bank. So it stores all of your memories, your pa- past patterns of behavior, um, <clears throat> all of your experiences, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so the amygdala, I mean, obviously the amygdala is there to keep us safe. Is it like a hangover from when we were less cavemen? Uh, yeah, cavemen. cavemen. So we <laughs> didn't die when we saw uh, what actually, I can't play the tooth tiger or let's go saber tooth tiger. But yeah. so it was the thing that told us to get away or to fight, or fight it. it. So what that just... does, what the amygdala will do if it sees if it's a threat. Now, when I've worked with lots of the equine ladies and gentlemen, but mainly ladies. Um, say somebody's lost their, their confidence with a particular horse or their show jumping or going down that wonderful center line. Um, what they're telling their brain over and over again is the negative experience. So the amygdala, the minute it, you even think about going to go to show jumping or going into a dressage test, whoo, just wakes up and it goes, Oh, hang on a minute. The last time we did this, And then, of course, what it does is it's going to fill your body and your brain full of cortisol. Cortisol is the stress hormone. And of course, when we were cavemen, um, it was it was essentially put into our body, our muscles to pump them up, to give us the strength to fight or to run away. Mm -hmm. Now, if we don't fight or run away or, you know, use that cortisol, that stress hormone is left in our system and it makes us feel a bit rubbish. And it makes us feel a bit tired and a bit worn out. Or it gives us gut problems like IBS and that kind mm. of stuff. Because, of course, it, it, we have to expel it somehow eventually. We have to get rid of it. Um, and that's often when people, you know, maybe if they're doing this kind of thing over and over again and having lots of cortisol flushed into their system, you're going to end up feeling quite depressed and quite sad and quite weak or, you know, angry even. Um, or you may find that you lose confidence in doing a skill that you've always been able to do Mm. or phobias can just all of a sudden appear and you can no longer get on the airplane and or you can no longer cope with a spider in the house but you you know prior to that you've been absolutely fine so that's your health and safety officer trying to protect you 
from what it thinks is really getting coming to hurt you but what you said then as well what it thinks because isn't it true as well that sometimes our memory bank isn't the perfect representation of exactly what happened absolutely because we can embellish memory um and and i know that well i'm, I'm aware now that they don't necessarily use memory in courts much because it's it's not very safe because we can implant memory and we we can embellish it so the more we think of a situation and again we've all done it so if you cast your mind back to something that happened maybe i don't know a situation maybe you fell off your horse or you had a row with somebody or whatever your your mind is going to add bits to that because you're going to get oh yeah well it was oh and that happened oh yeah and well when well, that happened as well and oh i just you know i can't cope with that anymore and and then of course that memory gets implanted into your hippocampus um so my job is to really help people to kind of be much more literal and logical about their thoughts and feelings what i don't do necessarily or try not to is keep going over the past too much yeah because if what you're talking about memories if we keep dragging those memories up out of the hippocampus because they haven't been processed properly um your brain doesn't know whether it's happening now or it happened 10 years ago i've heard that because you can also use that idea to your advantage can't you as well when you like imagine your you know, your best life or things like that you can visualization use it, you can use it positively as well can't you, you can. as long as the yes buts don't come in yeah 100 percent. yeah so one of the things you said then about not dragging up the past too much and also previously you mentioned about these pathways so can you explain how they work because actually dragging up the past can strengthen that connection can't it yeah so we have millions of pathways in our brain for, for doing all sorts of things, everything, you know. Um, around behaviours and thoughts, um, the brain has to find a pattern match. So when, say for instance, um, let me think, say I was to go um, and get on a horse. I haven't done that for a very, very long time. Um, my pattern match, that my brain is going to search, as I say, for a pattern match. So it'll go into my memory bank and it'll probably come up with a, a memory that wasn't so good. Um, and so then when I actually think about going riding or think about getting on a horse, my amygdala is going to jump up and go me um, and dance around and do whatever it does to say, Are you really sure you want to do this? And it will, it will pump some cortisol into my system. So then what I've done is I've yet again hardwired that thought process about riding yeah um, and we do it about all sorts of things so the more we think about something whether it's positive or negative we are going to get the electricity flowing between the neurons and growing stronger and stronger and it's going to obviously try and go along the path of least resistance so if it's something it's experienced over and over again whether it's negative or positive it's going to kind of choose that pathway yeah we know through, through neuroscience that the brain is kind of almost made of plasticine. So neuroplasticity means that we can change the way we act or behave or think. So people that have strokes, um, you know, brain injury, we know um, that, that through certain methods, they, they can build new pathways to either speak differently or learn how to speak again or to move that muscle again muscle memory you know retrain it um, so it could be that there's part of the brain that is actually damaged and that you can't use that now but but evidence is such that we can restore or rebuild by repetition so again the neuroscientists suggest it takes roughly 45 days to adapt or change a, a pattern of behavior but when you think how long it's taken you to build in that pattern of behavior, it's probably taken you flipping years because mm. um, we do it over and over again. 45 days in the great scheme of things is not very much. But really what that means is you, we have to do it through repetition. So you hardwire it. So the brain trusts it. This is like the habits thing, isn't it, though? It, it yeah. takes I me. Mean, I've heard lots of different numbers quoted, but yeah. you can't just go right today. I'm going to eat healthily. And then tomorrow you're sorted no you're still going to want that chocolate bar it's yeah. it's not just a case of one day you go right we're good now yeah. it's not that at all because you also i mean there's there's plenty of there's amazing books around and people that you know scientists that talk about it um but but you have to re 
kind of re reward your brain for doing what you want it to do. It has to feel good about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to have the positive thoughts because they also know that through scanning the brain and all that kind of MRI scans and all this to it, that if we have positive thoughts, and of course, when we're feeling depressed and anxious, we struggle to find the positive thoughts. Now, that's my job is to help people to find those. And we do. And I work hard to get them to say, come on, what's been good? What's been good? Um, and even with, though you've had a crappy situation or a bad situation, um, you will be able to look at what was good about the way you managed it or you dealt with it or somebody helped you. Or What that then does is it stimulates the serotonin and the endorphins and the dopamine and the oxytocin in your brain. So the good, healthy food that your brain needs to enable you to function in a fairly streamlined manner. But if all you ever do is think negative thoughts and put yourself down and beat yourself up, which we're very good at doing, um, you are just gonna produce that awful cortisol in your system that just will keep reminding you that you can't do it. And what's the point of trying? Because every time I try, it never works. Diets are the worst because we all start a diet on a Monday and we're all gung-ho. Um, you know, but then we don't really stick to it for the 45 day period or however long. And we don't replace the, the, the sort of negative thoughts in our brain with positive thoughts. When mm. people say, you know, actually, when I start losing weight and I see the results, then that motivates me. Well, of course it does, because it stimulates your good, happy chemicals. Yeah. As they're known. So it rewards you. So rewards are so important for us. Those positive. We're very good at putting ourselves down and not being kind to ourselves um, and you know I know through the lives and with Vic and yourself and when you put posts up and stuff there's a lot of let's be kind let's be nice to each other when we're kind to ourselves or other people we stimulate those good happy chemicals in our brain you know it's a real function it's not just a fluffy thing to do it mm. has a massive impact on the way we function as individuals day to day yeah and, and we get the we get the chemical boost. When we also stimulate all those wonderful chemicals and stuff in our brain, of course, we tell our body that it's not too bad, it's not so bad and things are okay. So our gut works better. Our two brains, our gut and the brain in our head, um, talk to each other and inform each other that things are okay and we're safe. So the amygdala stays nice and calm. But the thing is as well, when, when you, know, you have a positive experience and you feel good, you then go on to do more positive things, don't you? It's like a, we can get into a negative cycle, spiral, sorry, but we can also get into a really positive one, can't we? Massively so, massively so, because if you think that each time you have a positive thought and you do a positive action, you get the benefit from that, the brain wants more of it because it's like, whoa, this is good. And of course it will fire up the electrodes, you know, the, the, the hard wiring system of the brain and it likes it. And what that also does is it clears your mind to see, what you can achieve. We're much more able to achieve much more. So when we go to the gym and a lot of people say, you know, well, I really didn't want to go. I really couldn't be bothered. I had to drag myself out, but do you know what? I felt great afterwards. Yeah. Well, yeah, you did because <laughs> um, that's not to say, you know, cause I'm the same. I have to pull myself up and get myself there. And then when I come back, I've got the energy and I've got the motivation and I, I know the theory behind it, but of course it's difficult putting that into practice every day. Mm. But of course what you're doing is you're getting that wonderful, particularly dopamine, because dopamine is about achieving goals and you know, your brain wants to be able to think, yeah, I can do that, I can move forward, I can do that, I don't know, and I can actually, I'm good at that. And it just gives you that lovely, lovely rush. Definitely. Now, obviously, at the moment, we call, we're recording this during the pandemic. When people listen to this in years' time, in, in a few years' time, they're going to listen and go, she just never talk, shut up about coronavirus. <laughs> she just, because I've, I've had to mention it so much because a lot of the things that come up when I interview people, um, yeah. you know, I'm going to say to you next, a lot of people at the moment are feeling really blooming miserable about the situation we're in. Mm -hmm. And it can feel like we are completely out of control because we're not in charge of the rules. We're not in charge of who we can see because it's like six people at the moment. It might be less by the time this goes out. Who knows? But we can do things to feel better, can't we? We can. So think about everything we've just, you know, everyone that's listening, think about everything you've just, we've just talked about. 
So can you give us some tips that if we're feeling really uh, angry, miserable because of the situation we're in, that's going to help, help us? Okay. So the first thing is to not freak your brain out. So you've got to take it steady. And one of my sayings is always, what small step? Um, so when I'm working with individuals um, and they are feeling pretty miserable because they've had something awful happen and we've also got COVID going on. Um, so it's okay. Really sit down and yes, take a deep breath, you know, because we know that that slows the parasympathetic nervous system down and it informs your muscles that you're relaxing a wee bit. But you have got to train your brain to start looking at the positives. Okay. Forget not forget because we know it's all impacting us and some of us may lose our jobs and you know but we have to look at the small things so what's been okay today even changing the wording slightly words are so important to our brain if we use negative words it goes into our kind of subconscious and it will find negative stories um so we do have to work a wee bit hard um and think okay what's been good today What's been okay today? What has been better today than yesterday? You can scale yourself. You can say, okay, on a scale of one to 10, one, I want to jump off the bridge and hopefully none of you do. But 10 is I'm feeling in control today. So we're not looking at big, big pictures. Where would you put yourself on the scale? And if you say, well, I'm about a four and you think, okay, but you wake up tomorrow and I'm actually going to be an incredible four and a half. Mm. What would you be doing differently? Now, initially, people's brains go, ooh, I don't really get this. This is a bit weird, isn't it? However, the more you are gentle with your brain and you look after your brain, it will give you that. Yeah. And you can start very slowly looking at your preferred way of being. So if I was a four and a half instead of a four, I would be saying to myself, well, maybe I'm going outside a bit more. And then I'd say, so what's good about going outside? Well, it's a nice bit of fresh air. Okay, so what can you do in the fresh air that makes you feel good? Well, I could go out for a little walk. Even though COVID is going on around us, mm. I am allowed to go out for the... Okay, so what's different about you for going out for a walk? What's good about that? So what I'm doing very gently is allowing the brain to explore the positives. Each time you have a positive thought about going for a walk you will get the lovely serotonin going, oh, hang on a minute, this is nice. This is a positive thought. Let's give you a wee bit of good serotonin and endorphins and the rest of it. And it could be anything. It absolutely could be anything. I've got children that I work with who, and actually I've got some adults as well, but they will have a, a little jar. And lots of people know about this, but it's a, a kind of what you, your happy thoughts jar. But literally they write down, before they go to sleep at night, on a little bit of paper, what's been nice today, what was good today. And they put it in the jar. And then when they see me the next week or, you know, like a little tip is to look back over that. Don't just put it in and forget it. Allow your brain to have a bit more of that good food. So you remind yourself what's been good. And, you know, most people go, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. I forgot that was, oh, I forgot I did that. Oh, that was so nice. And of course, even those positive thoughts. So small, tiny steps. But also, if you want to be a bit more powerful, then you start thinking, well, let me think of a time prior to COVID, taking away all the restrictions, but what did I do that made me feel good? Mm. So it could be that I went and rode my horse. Well, you can at the moment still go and ride your horse. So one of the things is, well, do more of what works. Yeah. That sounds simple, I know, but actually when you break it down, it's a really good thing. What do you do? What have you got in your toolbox that has helped you in prior situations? You don't need to analyze the situation but what did you do? What little steps did you take that helped you? Well, I talked to a friend. Oh, so when could you talk to a friend? Because COVID's not going to stop you talking to a friend. How could you talk to that friend? You might not be able to see them physically, but how could you talk to them? What's good about talking to a friend? And so you see, you just build up on those positives the whole time. You could say it was solution focused. It is solution focused. You could say... <laughs> I think as well, what's really important is that a good thing could be that you had a warm cup of tea. Because I think if you're a parent, that's like, doesn't happen. But you had a hot cup of tea and it was in your favourite mug. 
it costs you nothing or it costs you how much it costs to boil the kettle or you go outside and have a bit of fresh air and you find some acorns or you find a lovely flower yeah these aren't expensive things they're free yeah. a lot of them, aren't they yeah well sadly unfortunately when we're when we're down the anxious end and the, and the sort of depressed end we really struggle to see that a, a free cup of tea or a cup of tea is a positive because mm. we're actually looking for much bigger things yeah so looking for the smaller things, of course, what you're doing is you're building, you're hardwiring positive behaviours in your brain and you're reminding your subconscious that actually not everything is negative and that there are some positives, but you need to look maybe a bit closer, a bit smaller. Yeah. And just start the brain switching on a wee bit. It's all too easy to switch on the cortisol. Oh, we can turn on the negative stress hormone so quickly. Yeah. And then we are justifying why we feel so rubbish. Well, I told you I couldn't do that, didn't I? I tried it, but it didn't work. Yeah. Well, I suppose, as you say, it's, instead of saying, oh, I've had a rubbish day, because you may have overall had a rubbish day, or one thing in that day may have been rubbish. So you know, actually, yeah, but I've got my favourite jumper on. Yeah. And What's good about wearing your favourite jumper? Well, I mean, this one's very cosy. I like this one. I've got a lot of jumpers I like. <laughs> um, so it's about expanding that sentence. And yes, of course, I've done it for years. So I can bang on it really quick. I can jump on a positive word mm. or a phrase that a client has used and I can then get them to expand it. But, you know, little tips at home, it's the same thing. It's just kind of like when you're with your children, you sit down maybe around the dinner table or before they go to bed and say, oh, what's been good today? You know, a lot of kids will go, mm, nothing much. <laughs> we, we often say, what's been your favourite thing? What's been your favourite thing, yeah. And it's never quite what you expect. It's, all, it's usually that they had, like, something for lunch they really liked. Yeah. And you're just kind of like, oh, okay. But it's lovely that that's been so positive for them. And it is the small things. Yeah. Or they yeah. saw someone they really liked. Or they played a game they loved. Yeah. And it's, it's nice, it's those things. Get them to ask you. So one each, you know, you ask them one thing and then their job is to ask you and vice versa. So it's not all just a one way with the parent and the child, you know, play the game. But, but, but as, as adults, we'll suddenly realise that we're actually bringing up real stuff. Mm. And, actually, and of course, we are getting that lovely, natural flowing, good chemicals in our brain by just playing that little game with, with the children. The other really, 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 really important thing is to get good sleep. Um, because sleep is one of the, if not the most effective way of looking after your brain. Um, and we tend to not give it much credit, really. Um, there's a, I can't remember his name. That's bad, isn't it? But there's a wonderful neuroscientist that talks a lot about sleep. And he's written books and all sorts of things. And he will say that on average, adults um, should get between seven to eight hours sleep a night. And he basically says those that brag that they don't, that they can cope on less. Nah, it's rubbish because eventually that's going to have a massive wear and tear on your brain. Mm -hmm. And potentially then, you know, the brain will end up with kind of some kind of illness um, or so um, Alzheimer's or, you know, so there's lots of evidence that sleep is the best medicine that you can give your brain and your body because when we get good effective sleep and trance, when we do the hypnotherapy bit, is really putting you into that lovely trance, REM, rapid eye movement state, where they believe that the brain goes to work and it sorts out stuff. So your conscious and your subconscious kind of work together to process the events of the day. So when we often go into REM, people kind of think they're dreaming, really. Um, but it's the brain's way of kind of going, well, I can get rid of that or I need to hold on to that, or maybe that's what I'll do about that in the morning. And that old saying of go to, you know, sleep on it and you'll feel better about it in the morning. Of course it's true, um, because you've allowed your brain the opportunity to just take a breath and to sort it out and to fathom out what it really means. But sleep is essential. And during these times of COVID, of course, lots of people really suffer um, from lack of sleep, ability to get to sleep, you know, so it's about looking at healthy routines, um, bedtime routines and what we do. And, you know, one of the things I do, of course, is I give people my guided relaxation and that kind of sends you off into a lovely, relaxed sleep. Um, but it's just really training your brain to know that when it hears my voice going on and on and on and saying certain things, 
it just goes off into this nice relaxed state. Um, lots of people use, you know, apps nowadays and, and what you shouldn't do in your bedroom. Well, they say there's only two things you should do in your bed, sleep and sex. I think I'm going to have to put an explicit on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we do, you know, we, we play on our iPhones, our other phones are available, iPhones, iPads, television, um, all these things that distract us actually from sleep. Distra well, and they stimulate. <clears throat> and they also do a chemical thing where they, they probably cut down the effectiveness of your natural melatonin. So it's interesting that people um, who, who struggle to go to sleep um, will take melatonin supplements, but still go on their phone or watch telly before going to sleep. <laughs> I see. Cut out the telly, cut out the phone. I mean, it's not that simple. I absolutely respect that. You know, we, we all do it. But if you want to sleep better, yeah. that's the solution focused approach. If yeah. you don't like what you're doing, do something different instead. I know it sounds simple, but if you want to get better sleep and I tell you the theory around sleep, then what are you going to do? You're going to carry on watching, listening and playing on your phone, or you're going to turn it off. And it, you know, that has to be your responsibility. You know, there are certain times when I, as a solution focused therapist, I would go, so what are you going to do then? You're going to do it or you're not going to do it. Um, that's not to say that I'm harsh and, and cruel. No, no, you're not, at, you're not <laughs> at all. But I think, as you say, there is a point where you've got to say, well, actually, what are you going to do? Because as you say, you can tell people to do everything, but actually, what are they going to do? Just that one thing, that one little step, as you've said, yeah. that they can do to make a difference. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm solution focused therapy is, is not about telling people what to do. It's about informing people of what's happening possibly in the brain and um, listening is one of the most important things. Um, but it's not necessarily as a therapist saying, right, what I suggest you do is, um, and it's not necessarily giving people homework and all that kind of stuff. It, because often when I suggest, or if I was to do that a lot, people go, it's not that easy, is it? You know, And they'll listen to me and they'll nod and they'll smile, but actually, inside their limbic system inside their brain they're going yeah right hmm. you know the yeah buts come in but if i can guide people to help them find the what small step yeah. and i can see it in their brain when they're working with me and their eyes go up to the ceiling and you can tell that their brain is searching for well what have we done in the past that's worked what yeah. could i do what small step could i take well i could leave my phone downstairs rather than taking it upstairs and yeah. then of course it's their solution yeah and does this all so obviously we've talked about how this works when you feel low but does the same apply with um let's go confidence anxiety and let's go performance as well so if you want to you know, be better it does the same apply with everything absolutely um, i've worked with two just recently two lovely dressage riders one's professional and the other was at kiso last weekend or the weekend before and they and, and fortunately they put up lovely reviews so i can talk about them um but you know they wanted help one had a terrible accident on a horse um and broke her back and you know so understandably was a bit scared to get back on um but her chimp um, was doing its nuts <laughs> it's <laughs> flipping all over the place <laughs> mad angry with its lab coat yeah. just furious but quite rightly so to a point yeah you know it's it's a dangerous sport however so this was about actually when we looked at emptying their stress bucket, as we call it, because we all have a stress bucket and we all pile stuff in it. And that could her stress bucket could have been full of all sorts of things. But we know that in the equine world, sometimes um, people can get a bit because we start comparing ourselves mm -hmm. with, with other people. And that goes in our stress bucket and all these kind of stuff. So and then fear, natural fear. So each time, of course, she went to get on this beautiful horse um her chimp quite rightly went nah um <laughs> you know Oof. and as her mother i'd have been doing the same thing so my job with her and i'm still working with her thankfully which is wonderful um was to really get her brain to calm down and to look at her preferred way of being with this horse and you know all kinds of things but but actually it's really improved her riding with her other horses as well. And she's gone out to competitions over the last few weeks and has got, you know, has won everything. 
Um, and that's because, of course, she's in the right place in her brain and she's feeling much more relaxed. Therefore, there's not as much stress hormone in her body and her muscles. So when she gets on the flipping horse, her backside isn't as tight and her hands aren't as tight. Her knees aren't squishing because, of course, her brain is taking control. And it, that kind of chemical reaction isn't flowing through to the horse. Yeah, absolutely. Because horses really can, you know, as, as you well know, yeah, you get on and you're tense and the te- horses go, horse goes, well, what are we scared of? I'm scared now. And then yeah, yeah. you get more tense because the horse feels like it's about to erupt. And then he gets more tense because you're more, it's just awful. Bam. Yeah. Yeah. And the other girl, you know, who, who was going off to Kiso, she messaged me to say that, you know, prior to competition, her nerves just go crazy and she gets really mm-hmm. anxious and the thought of going into the warm up arena and all the rest of it, perfectly normal understandable feelings so i had three days to work with her <laughs> prior to going to Kiso. so we did the initial consultation on the monday then we had a session on the wednesday and then we had another session the wednesday and the friday i think it was was in a truck um at Kiso. um you know she was in the little cabin and and the wi-fi kept kicking out and all this but it didn't matter because it, basically what i was doing was i was getting her brain to calm down but getting her to visualize how she would rather be um yeah the, the preferred future literally two minutes ahead not in the future but actually how do you want that center line to go where well, you want it to go really really straight really calm yeah. and actually then you're looking for how to make that work yeah versus how that's going to go badly wrong how it went last time yeah. yeah and also looking at you so i really got her to look at well what are you going to be wearing Ooh, you've got your tailcoat on you've got your lovely posh boots on and you know so that was giving her lots of lovely um neurotransmitters in her brain you know the chemicals in her brain just thinking about how gorgeous she was going to look so you were setting her brain up to to function quietly so that's about performance and that's you know we know that solution focused work is great for for sports you know athlete psychology and all the rest of it it's helping them to look at how they want it to be and they rehearse it in here there was a wonderful experiment done on three basketball teams. Um, and basically the first lot had to just visualize playing the game. The second lot were playing the game and were trained. And then the third lot they did nothing with. Um, when it actually came to it, the, the people that visualized it came out on top. Well, in terms of when they actually played? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Because what they'd done, of course, um, is that they built fabulous pattern match in their brain when it went perfectly well so golfers we know use this an awful lot because they um i don't know what you call it with golfing but they got the stick (laughs) the club the club club, and they they are visualizing every single movement like the swing yeah so but you know so that's with sports performance but any kind of performance you know if people have built up a phobia of riding and the wonderful Vic, and she won't mind me mentioning it, who we did the lives with, you know, she got a wee bit of a phobia around riding a few years ago. Um, and so we did what I would call the rewind and reframe. So you're basically boring the brain with the old pattern and you're implementing a new preferred pattern match. Um, and when she did that, she, got, I, you know, she, got, she was imagining herself with, I don't know, Mickey Mouse or who knows, music going in the background but she made the scenario fun and relaxed so the next time she got on the particular horse she was although she would have had a still a wee bit of cortisol pumping around but she was much more relaxed much more able to just crack on yeah. um and you know it, it hadn't become a sort of hard hardwired phobia and so it was easy so i work with people that um you know fear of flying and fear of riding and all kinds of stuff like that. So that is all about performance. You yeah. know, it's, it's no different from an elite athlete to someone just wanting to go up an escalator. Um, or someone wanting to kind of do more in their business as well. I think what you said about comparison is such a big one there. I, I yeah. know so many people will look at other people's success or what they're putting out there into the world, because we know yeah. that I love social media, yeah. but it is that, second of a day when you've taken a good picture you're doing a story it's not the whole story and a lot of people only tell the highlights rather than show the other stuff so you're comparing yourself to someone's best moment yeah and then you get all those negative things about well you're not good at this you should give up 
but actually it's not an accurate thing to compare to and also it's not really serving us at all is it it's not helping you as a person become better to think about what you want not screw everybody else what you want and how you're going to get there how that would look to you absolutely the most important person that you can ever look after first and foremost is yourself and people often think that's oh that's being selfish no it's really not because of course if you don't feed your brain and you look at your personal goals and desires you really haven't got the energy or the motivation to be there for other people but this comparison thing is massive and we know it's not just social media though you know we we as parents are guilty of it with our children you know we look around and we see what everyone else is doing and we start putting on a wee bit of pressure onto Mm -hmm. our kids and building in those pathways in their little brains um and then we get the imposter syndrome well i shouldn't be here i'm not good enough how on earth have i got here i haven't got all the degrees that everybody else has got oh you know and we get that but of course all those negative thoughts are just filling your system with with cortisol so of course your brain is going well you shouldn't be then should you so yes i mean the work i do i work with people in all kinds of for all kinds of reasons you know and it could be confidence issues self-esteem fear direction people wanting direction I don't know where to go in life and I just you know I try so many things but I never complete them so of course every time you do something you're knocking your dopamine because you're not completing a goal Mm. Um, and so you just are building in a a pattern a hardwired pattern of, of failure or as you perceive it to be failure so you know people come come to me for that people come to me um, because they blush a lot. Um, people come to me for eating disorders. People come to me for all kinds of things. Um, but essentially, it's about helping people to understand how the brain is functioning around that specific issue. Um, and also, I think that they have got control over it, that, that they can make a change. Yeah. Because I, I, know, I know you said at the, at the top of the podcast, I think people come and go, yeah, but I've always done that. And the next thing is, well, that's me. This is how I am and that's life. And I think just knowing that you can change, Mm. that whatever the situation is, even if it's really, really rough, Mm. you can do something to make it better for yourself. Yeah. That's quite powerful, isn't it? Because people, you know, again, come to me who have had really quite traumatic lives and they may have been abused or they may have, you know, around grief. Mm. Um, and, And so, you know, when I often start with what's been good, you have to be careful. Mm. But there are still things that they, people that are dying with cancer. I've had, you know, clients that, that, that have died now, but, but, you know, are going through the process of dying. And what they wanted to do was be more in control of their death. Okay. Um, so that was a very powerful thing. Um, and I still had to be upbeat with them. I still had to say what's been good about today. Yeah. You know, and yeah. they would say to me, well, the sun came out. Yeah. And I, and I went for a, two minute walk Jackie that's incredible and I go that's amazing like, of course it is what else has been good because I'm still giving them the power in their brain to manage what's going on with them so even people that have gone through extreme trauma um I have if we help them and support them to understand the function of their brain have got the ability to grab it by the ujits and take more control no. and feel good about themselves absolutely I, mean, I was going to say any tips but to be honest I think the whole podcast has been filled with with tips if you had to give one though one tip that anyone listening can do now what would it be sleep not literally if you're like driving a car if you're at work <laughs> I'm not getting in trouble for this I can't give one tip uh smile right smile okay because smiling you can trick your brain by smiling to think that everything is okay so not a gritted teeth smile, but the physical smile, the physical movement of your muscles, and again, there's been research around this, um, informs your brain and it translates it and it goes, oh, that's a nice feeling. And it'll give you a wee shot of the endorphins and the serotonin. And also, you know, if you're smiling, generally when people smile, they kind of move a bit and they sort of stand up and they put their shoulders down and they lift their heads up. And so with, also you're telling your brain that you're feeling a bit better. Um, yeah. so you're tricking it essentially because you can trick your brain and the other side effect is if you smile at somebody they're gonna have a lovely time too smile smile you can still smile in your car if you are walking and you're keeping a social distance you can still smile. say smile back 
aren't you? Yeah, yeah they smile back and it's all a win. You can, yeah, yeah. And it, it is a kind of, um, you get a chemical rush from seeing other people smile. Um, and so they get it from you and you get it from them. So it's a double whammy. That's really cool. Well, you have been amazing. My little brain now is buzzing. Um, so can you tell everyone where they can find you online? Um, yeah, so it's, um, I'm on Instagram. So it's JMC Hypnotherapy. And then it's www.jmchypnotherapy.co.uk. And I'm on Facebook as well. You're on Facebook as well now? I've always been on Facebook. I'm all, I've always been on Facebook, but I haven't done much on Facebook recently. I have to say, when um, obviously Jackie was part of the really amazing Equiboodle and me and Maeve and Emily Cole competition, um, and I, I messed about with a, um, a bit of artwork and missed a key letter out of hypnotherapy. I missed the Y out, didn't I? Because it was hippotherapy I had you doing, which is completely... Hypotherapy. I can do hypotherapy. I can do went, anything, me. He went, yeah, I'll give that a go. Do, do you know what it is? <laughs> yeah, so one of, the, one of the other things I was going to say is to... Um, we all Google everything and we all look up stuff, but one of the... Um, really interesting people that I follow a lot is Loretta Bruning and she's American and she does put some wacky stuff up but she runs what's called the Inner Mammal Institute and she gives away lots of free stuff online but she also has written a book called um, I think it's Brain Training or How to Train Your Brain um, but she talks a lot about the neurotransmitters and how to change pathways and patterns of behavior so it's really good very simple stuff um, but again, you know, it, she talks a lot about we can change the way we are. We don't need to, if we don't like the way we are, we can change it if we want to. But if you like it, crack on. Absolutely. It's good. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jackie. It's been amazing. It's been lovely. Thank you very much for asking me. It's fabulous.